I'm showing you these images of oil in the Gulf of Mexico because this is very personal to me. I grew up on the Gulf Coast, and I still have family and a lot of childhood friends living there who were impacted by this oil mess. And when the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded into flames on April 20th and sunk two days later, interestingly on Earth Day, as soon as I could, I dropped everything and traveled to my hometown of Mobile, Alabama. I just needed to go and be there and experience this firsthand. And while there, I spoke with a lot of people. I talked with fishermen and seafood vendors, hunting and fishing guides. I met with government officials and BP executives. And I went out into the Gulf of Mexico and I dived under the oil, which was kind of a disturbing experience. It was like being under a, an opaque black blanket of oil. And I was there in June and July during the heyday of oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico through a 21 inch pipe, which it did for three months. And this trip broke my heart. A lot of people down there are really hurting. And the Gulf of Mexico suffered an ugly and sustained violation. And while there, I just couldn't stop wondering, how did we get here? What have we done? What are we doing to the earth? Well, in the case of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, it's directly related to our need for energy, oil. Our entire planetary society is dependent upon oil. We've evolved to require oil to power our homes, our industry, our transportation, our lifestyles. And oil is expensive and obviously dangerous to produce. It's dirty to use. And I think we can all agree that it's not particularly healthy for life on Earth. But problems related to oil and energy are just a few of what I've personally witnessed in this great job that I have, which has sent me traveling around the world for over 30 years making natural history films, often in remote locations. And in just my lifetime, I've seen significant changes occurring in places that I've visited on numerous occasions. I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing, where you take a wonderful family vacation to a beautiful place, and you return five or ten years later and hardly recognize it. But since the Industrial Revolution some 200 years ago, or perhaps because of it, we've enthusiastically made major changes to the earth, and they're not all good. We're polluting our air, lakes, rivers, streams, estuaries, gulfs, and our, our oceans. We're warming our planet and unleashing dire consequences as a result. We're bulldozing our forests. We're producing toxic chemicals, which end up in our water supplies and our oceans. We're also manufacturing vast quantities of plastic, which for tens, hundreds, or even thousands of years are strangling animals in ecosystems. And we're overfishing our oceans, some iconic species, to near extinction. And the list goes on and on. And we know of most of these problems, and I'm not going to go into the details here. But fortunately, countering each one of these assaults to the earth are individuals and groups of people dedicated to solving them. And that's a good thing. I think it's vital. We should loudly applaud and generously support these people, many of whom are in the audience today or listening to this talk. But is it enough? Will we ever reach a point where we've actually moved beyond these problems and left them behind us? Are we even asking the right questions and in the right order? I believe that we're dealing with most of the Earth's problems from the bottom up. And what is needed is a top-down approach. Hold that thought. When I was in high school, I took a biology class and we did a little experiment. We were given a petri dish, a little glass dish, about five inches in diameter. And the bottom of this dish was an auger, a rich growing medium for small organisms. We put a little fungus on the edge of this auger, put the lid on the dish and put it off to the side. Not much happened for a few days. Then we noticed that the fungus was starting to grow and multiply and migrate across the top of the auger. In a few days, it had completely covered the bottom of the dish and fruiting bodies were sprouting up, hitting the bottom of the lid. A couple of days later, everything changed. The fungus had all died and collapsed into the bottom of the dish into a black ooze. The system crashed. Then I took a year off between college and graduate school, and I worked at an aquaculture facility on Oahu. <laughs> if you live in Hawaii for a year, you become a resident. School's a lot cheaper, and I didn't have much money, so it was an easy decision. Not to mention it was kind of a nice place to live as a single early 20s. Anyway, it was a good time. But at this aquaculture facility, we were growing a variety of animals 
in, a, in various tanks and ponds. And one of the tanks that we used were 12 foot of diameter above ground swimming pools, about four and a half feet deep. And there was an empty one in the back, so I filled it with clean seawater, left it alone. In a couple of days, I noticed the water was getting cloudy. And a few days later, an incredible phytoplankton bloom had occurred in the tank, and this bright green algae was so thick that if you put your hand down in the water, it would disappear within a foot. And then I went away for a long weekend. And when I returned, I looked in the tank, and the water was again clear, only now there was a brown scum completely covering the bottom of the tank, dead algae. The system had crashed. Now, I haven't run this experiment, but I'm pretty sure how it would end up. If you went out into a large field, a beautiful meadow with wildflowers growing everywhere, plants, and constructed an impermeable wall around, say, an acre of it, and inside this enclosure, you introduced a couple of rabbits. Could be goats, sheep, doesn't matter. Well, those rabbits would be really happy for a couple of weeks with no predators to keep them in check. Those original two rabbits would become six, 16, 50, 150, 500 rabbits. And before long, if you looked inside that enclosure, what you would find is no living vegetation and thousands of dead, starved rabbits laying on the ground. So let's just review this. You've got a Petri dish. Inside the dish is an auger providing the fungus everything it needs to rapidly reproduce and multiply, which it does until it runs out of space, uses up the nutrients in the auger, crashes, and dies. Swimming pool, same thing. The sunlight and water provide the algae all it needs to reproduce and multiply until it runs out of space, uses up the nutrients in the water, crashes and sinks to the bottom. The meadow is no different. Our bunnies being little bunnies reproduce like crazy, use up all of the food in the, in the enclosure, starve to death, run out of space, and they die. And then there's this, Earth. In a closed biological system, a system with finite, non-renewable resources and limited space, if population is left unchecked, the system will eventually crash. It has to. That's the way biological systems work. And if you back way up and look at Earth from a great distance, you'll see it as a small blue planet floating in space, a gigantic vacuum. The Earth we live on is a closed system. Apart from a random asteroid or cosmic dust, we don't get anything else here. What we have on Earth is all we will ever have. In fact, we can't even get rid of anything. And since humans have no real predators to keep them in check and we're rapidly populating a planet with finite space and resources, just like the petri dish, the swimming pool, and the meadow, we're headed toward an inevitable crash. It has to happen if we continue having babies at the current exponential rate. We'll simply run out of food, water, and living space. So what I mean by we're dealing with most of the Earth's problems from the bottom up rather than the top down is at the bottom lie the manifestations of the problem, the symptoms. And at the top is the overriding cause of most of these problems, overpopulation and the out-of-control consumption of resources. And that is being seriously neglected. Until we arrest the wholesale population of the Earth, I think we're going to continue fighting more and more complex battles, uphill battles, battles I don't see us winning if the boundless demand for resources continues. <laughs> now, TED Talks are supposed to be entertaining and a platform for new ideas. And I think I'm failing miserably on both counts. This isn't funny, and it's certainly not a new idea. People have been harping on overpopulation for ages. So let's just look at population growth on Earth. We remained in the millions of people until the 19th century. In 1804, we hit our first 1 billion people. 1804. 123 years later, in 1927, we were at 2 billion. 3 billion, 33 years later, in 1960, 4 billion in 1974, 5 in 1987, and 6 billion in 1999. And it's projected that next year, in 2011, we'll have 7 billion people living on Earth. You see where this is headed. Population and consumption are at the top of our problems, and I think we need to deal with population and consumption first, now. And, I, and only then will solving the rest of our problems become feasible. So, now that I've put us in such a good mood on those happy notes, what can we do? 
Well, efforts to control population on Earth have been tried for millennia. In about 500 BC, Confucius warned of the dangers of excessive growth. In the 4 and 300s BC, Plato voiced many concerns on overpopulation, and his little known student Aristotle concluded that overpopulation would bring certain poverty on the citizenry. And this continued through the Middle Ages. Many others were throwing up red flags on overpopulation. Thomas Malthus, a British economist and clergyman, wrote an essay on population stating that human misery was an absolute necessary consequence of overpopulation. That was in 1798. And all through the 20th century, others were warning about it. We, not, we all know of Paul Ehrlich's famous book, The Population Bomb, that he wrote in 1968, where he likened overpopulation to cancer, the uncontrolled multiplication of cells. And what he called population explosion was the uncontrolled multiplication of people. And that if only the symptoms of cancer are treated, you might make the patient feel better for a while, but he will eventually die, often horribly. And the same fate awaits humans if only the symptoms of population explosion are treated. And that we must shift our efforts from the treatment of symptoms to cutting out the cancer. He went on to suggest, <laughs> this is a true story, that a compulsory birth regulation by putting small or temporary doses of a sterilant in our water supplies and our staple foods. Well, needless to say, this runs up against a few obstacles. There are huge obstacles associated with controlling population on Earth. There are political issues, cultural and very strong religious beliefs. It's not exactly consistent with be ye fruitful and multiply. It counters many basic views of freedom. People just don't like to be told how many children they can have. So here's a plan, a top-down approach. We begin an ambitious global initiative. We use films, print, radio, television, the power of the internet, any means available to get people thinking and talking and understanding and buying into this inevitability and acting on it. We would need governments on board, developing countries, America, the world, and demonstrate that the floods, the famine, the disease, the lack of clean water, the weird weather, literally most of the problems we're facing are directly related to too many people demanding too many resources. So I began, I, I propose we start a global initiative to replace yourselves. Replace only yourselves. Maybe it should be a mandate. And we give the heal the oceans of the world a chance to actually heal the gaping wounds of the earth. And we began immediately and locally, right here in Santa Barbara. I would love to see this come out of the TEDx American Riviera Conference. Santa Barbara has a rich history of innovative thinking and research and brilliant ideas that have been spread around the world. Earth Day's an example. We could start by producing a high-end short film, a PSA, something we can easily and instantly distribute around the world these days. And it might be a redo of the little animation that I showed you where you have a series of circular living systems, one dissolving to the next, starting with the petri dish. We see the fungus grow and multiply until it runs out of space, uses up the nutrients in its dish, dies and sinks to the bottom. This dissolves to the swimming pool. Same thing. The algae multiplies until it runs out of space, uses up the nutrients in the water, crashes and dies. The pool dissolves to the meadow where our little bunnies being bunnies rapidly reproduce. They eat their way through all of their food. They crash and they die. The meadow dissolves to the earth. The message, of course, being that's where we're headed. And nobody wants to see this happen to the earth. Earth is large enough and complex and diverse enough to have maintained a stable balance in the organisms and the predator-prey relationships living on it. And it's done this beautifully throughout its history until humans came along. Humans are the first animals that Earth has ever seen capable of consciously and permanently shifting this balance. And that's exactly what we're doing. But humans also have the capacity to stop it and reverse these trends. And I feel we need to do that, and we need to do it immediately. It reminds me of James Lovelock's Gaia theory, which, which essentially states that the biosphere, the living part of the Earth, will do whatever it takes to maintain a homeostasis, a stability, conditions suitable and necessary for life on Earth. And when an organism gets out of whack, it either eliminates it 
or it alters it. And it seems to me that if humans don't immediately alter the way we're behaving, then we're kind of putting targets on our back for elimination. And I don't think anybody wants that. I really believe that we need to swiftly act to flatline population and consumption, or population and consumption will flatline us. And welcome to the meadow. Now, the theme for TEDx American Riviera is imagine that. Uh, w- with respect to the organizers, I don't like imagining that. Do you? Thank you. <laughs>